Hello and welcome to The Actor and the Engineer. My name is Paul James. I am the actor. My name is Josh Knapp. I'm the broadcast engineer. Here we go, Josh. You said that very chippy tonight. I'm Josh Knapp. I'm the broadcast engineer. No, I'm about to say, like, uh, to tell you that you are correct. And when we brought up this, when I brought up this movie to uh, to go watch it, and you're like, oh, I don't know, it's not a big deal. I don't really care about it that much. And, and I was like, oh, no, I think it looks good. And then... Uh, <laughs> And then I watched it last night and it's just kind of like it was kind of like a ho hum movie for me. There were a few really cool parts, but I don't know. It was just kind of blah. First of all, before we get into all of that, let's let's go back just a split second. I wasn't like, oh, I just had a little loss of faith with Jim Jarmusch with um, Only Lovers Left Alive. Yes, by the way, I'm going to say only lovers left behind, and I'm going to say the dead don't lie. I swear that's, I'm going to say those two <laughs> titles, so forgive me. I went up to get my ticket. I said, can I get one for the dead don't lie? And the guy behind the box office goes, the dead don't die. Uh, and I was like, you're a film buff, aren't you? And he was like, yeah. And I was like, yeah, that little condescending tone in your voice gave it away. And he was like, well, that's the title of the movie. And I said, you know what? You're right. You're absolutely right. Young kid, you know, uh, working at a movie theater, probably knows more about movies than both of us put together. You could just tell by the way he was like, not offended, but wanted to make sure it was correct. He's like, you don't even know Jim Jarmusch. Well, <laughs> uh, well, it seemed like he knew a lot more than um, you would expect. And he was not offended, but wanted to make sure that it was corrected. So I probably mm -hmm. will say that. But only Lovers Left Alive left me kind of pondering why is Jim Jarmusch doing these genre films or these uh, typical Hollywood movie type films, especially in the vampire age of everything, you know, Twilight and all of the above. So I was perplexed by why he chose to do it. And the film did not show me anything that indicated why he was choosing to do it. I feel the complete opposite about The Dead Don't Die. I loved it really i was thrilled i was thrilled by it um i know it's getting a lot of weird mixed reviews and there are a lot of people who are in your camp who are like oh hum yeah whatever just something about it like i got most of the references and i thought a lot of the easter eggs which i'm sure that's not what you call them in jim jarmusch world but that's what we call them in you know the rest of the people's world I understood a lot of the things that he was saying. I think the statement is much more bold. Um, and maybe this genre of zombie films allowed him to do that kind of thing. So I thought, hmm, maybe I missed something in uh, Only Lovers Left Alive. So I went back and watched it last night. I don't necessarily think that I missed anything in particular. But strangely enough, in that movie, they do call everybody zombies. So I thought that was interesting. So apparently he's been on this kick for a little bit of a, uh, a time frame where he's exploring these atypical Hollywood movie types with his disposition and um, attitude in a good way. And he's exploring a lot of themes that I think are important. And this one just kind of smacks you in the face. So I love the purposeful, stylized cadence to everybody's way of talking mm -hmm. yes that's a zombie i love that kind of stuff because it's not tongue-in-cheek but it's also it's a way of letting the audience know that not everybody speaks the way that they speak in movies so i like that maybe because i come from the theater and mammoth and shakespeare and it's very stylized and it's um a very specific cadence that my ear tunes to it but i love that i, I I loved calling out things for what they were. I loved putting it right smack in front of you. So yeah, I had a good time halfway through the movie. I was like, uh Oh, uh, um, this might end up being one of my favorite movies of the year. And I'm going to have to kind of take back all those things I said to Josh, even though I didn't really say anything bad. I just was not about it, but, um, yes, ladies and gentlemen, I was wrong. <laughs> so anybody who ever says Paul James can't admit that he's wrong. So yeah, I, I enjoyed it. I think I could write down the moments that you had to resist rolling your eyes. I, I thought, oh, Josh is not going to like that. Josh is not going to like that. Josh is not going to. I, I, I could probably count the moments and tell you what they are. But yeah, I enjoyed it. I took it for what it was and I, I wrote it. Well, I, 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 let me be honest. 
too is there was there was a group of people in front of me and so <laughs> as Paul rolls his eyes there's a group of people in front oh. of me and they were there to have fun and they were going to have fun no matter what and they were respectful when the movie started uh, but it seemed like they were straining to laugh at things and they were laughing at things like laughing I mean, this is a judgment, I guess, but they were laughing to me like too hard at certain things. And it's kind of like, you're really working hard at this. You're really working hard at trying to have fun or trying to make this into a comedy that I don't think it necessarily was the type of comedy they were looking for. They were looking for like bridesmaids comedy. And this is a little bit more, I, I think it's, a little bit in some ways it's a little more complex but really it's 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 just a different kind of deadpan humor that i don't know if they were into it in in the way i i don't know it just seemed like it was striking them in a different way than it was striking like i don't know everybody else in the theater and so there were definitely some funny parts i, la- I laughed out loud at certain parts but that i think also like ha- held my mind while watching the movie but the other thing i noticed is that the the trailer which i've seen multiple times just in seeing other movies there were some really kind of like funny laugh out loud parts in the trailer and they were all in the movie and some in different orders and things like that but it still it still seemed like all like other comedies that the, the theatrical ver- version of the trailer has a lot of the really funny parts to it and so I knew a lot of the things that were coming up that were that were going to happen. And so that was partially also my fault for watching the trailer, I guess. But at the same time, I felt like there should have been more to the film than what there was. There is definitely this undercurrent of uh, of the, you know, the whole point of Jarmer's doing the movie, I think, is to kind of call out people's complacency with being, you know, addicted to their phones or the things right in front of them versus looking at things that are happening in the environment or whatever else you want to, however else you want to categorize his themes. That's, I I think that's one of his big themes and, you know, rep, you know, saying that, Oh, the zombies are attracted to the things that they were doing when they were alive, uh, equating the zombies that are undead to their life before they were undead. So I, I get all that. I understand all that. I internalized all that. And you're right. I also did enjoy the cadence that they used as far. I mean, the best the best example of that was when they go and find the bodies in the diner and everybody says, you know, the same kind of things, you know, could it have been a wild animal? Could it have been a pack of wild animals? I mean, it, it's it's great. And, you know, it's rule of threes and all that stuff. It, it's going to come back and it it was it was very well done. Tilda Swinton is amazing. All the main characters are amazing. You know, Adam Driver, it's I mean Adam Driver, it seems like he can't miss nowadays. I don't I don't know as far as like the movies he chooses to do plus how well he how adept he is to the the different characters that he plays and and how they're all they all kind of have a piece of of uh, they have a through line uh with them. Uh, I was I I love Bill Murray. I thought he was great in this. Tom Waits was great. Chloe Sevigny was was good. I mean, she had a, a few less scenes than than the other depth than the deputy and the chief did. But so I, I I don't necessarily have any complaints about. I I've not figured out Caleb Landry Jones. I don't I don't I don't get him. I don't get it. But he makes bold choices, and I'm sure that other actors love that. But. I just I, I don't know. There's something something about it that seems like a lot of the choices he makes. I feel like he could have made different choices than it would be better. But that's me talking not as an actor, but as just a moviegoer. So, but anyway, Danny Glover was great, but he's he's good in everything he does. I, I don't have any complaints I, I, as far as the performance goes. I think it's the pacing of the movie, the stakes, and then what well, we can get close to the end. Get to spoilers. A little bit farther through the podcast, but I think that yeah, for me that the pacing was a little bit off, and I didn't really see necessarily where it was gonna go. And then once it went where it went, I was kind of like, oh, it was a little disappointing. 
I thought that the before we see zombies was a lot more fun than once we see zombies. I don't disagree with that last statement. I thought I am not going to enjoy this movie as much once the zombies start taking over. And then I thought, okay, Iggy Pop as a zombie is just like perfect typecasting, first of all. Um, and I thought, well, maybe it's just going to be these two. And then they start to appear and then it starts to become a zombie picture. But for whatever reason, by that point, I was adjusted to I was adjusted to the tone and attitude of the film that I was taking it for what it was. And I guess I was kind of playing a game where I was trying to figure out um, uh, little Easter eggs or what this meant or what that meant or, uh, oh, okay, this is a statement about society and uh, consumerism and uh, materialism and all that other stuff. And we need to get back to nature. And it's interesting to me that Tom Waits is the only guy in the movie that doesn't have that same cadence. He has a normal speaking cadence and that's Tom Waits. Waits. He just doesn't have a normal speaking voice. He just does it. So for him to be the voice of the picture, the everyday man, Hermit Bob, right? Mm -hmm. That's what his name is, right? It, it, it's funny and it's ironic and it's sort of a homage to people who love Jim Jarmusch films because Tom Waits is in quite a few of them. And then, you know, uh, coffee and cigarettes is a, a kind of a, a theme throughout uh, Jim Jarmusch's films and or titles of Jim Jarmusch's films. So I liked all of that stuff. And I thought once we get to all the zombies and all the killing, it's just going to turn into something that I, I'm not going to, I'm not going to understand why, this filmmaker who has always intrigued me and maybe is just a tad bit, I don't want to say more intelligent than me because I don't know him, but he just seems like he's one of the smartest guys in the room. So maybe I'm not really understanding what he's putting out there. Although his movies do speak to me. I like quite a few of his films, but once it took over, I thought to myself, okay, this is sort of similar to what a zombie movie usually traditional traditionally turns out. But then they call it out on itself again. And I thought, <laughs> I, I, I don't know, that breaking of the fourth wall thing yeah. doesn't normally work for me. But when you break the fourth wall, when you're not really breaking the fourth wall is great. That early too, that early in the film. Yeah, let's just say from this point on, spoiler alert, alert, not that there's anything that you can give away per yeah. se in this film, but they do make mention of things that make you know that they're actors who are aware that they're in a movie playing characters and they're aware that they're aware. And so for it to come back a third time right before the Deus Ex Machina shows up, which I thought was going to solve all of the problems, yeah. but it doesn't. Nope. It just puts another weird kind of twist in it. But that's also really cool too because everybody thinks that Tilda Swinton is an alien anyway. <laughs> so for her, you know, for that to happen later on in the film, it's almost like, how do you end that storyline? I, I don't know. So for her to all of a sudden just disappear into the mothership is <laughs> brilliant because it's exactly what people think should happen. But yet nobody who goes to see a Jim Jarmusch film might think that's going to happen. And then so it happens anyway. And you're thinking, well, that's really clever. You did exactly what people were expecting you not to do, expecting you to do. Mm -hmm. That to me is funny. And I laughed out loud. There were only two other people in, in the theater and I had a much more pleasant movie going experience. They were kind of talking in the beginning. And um, yeah, have you ever done that thing where people are talking? You kind of, It's kind of like a knee jerk reaction. You just turn around and look. You didn't really mean to mm -hmm. and you don't really want to get into any kind of confrontation. And it doesn't do any good nowadays anyway, because we're in the cell phone um, world. So people just are on their phone anyway. So you could spend your whole entire two hours in a movie telling people to shut the hell up and it won't do any good. By the way, side note, um, my prediction for the future is, and I don't know if we've talked about this. I think we've talked about it um, off podcast. My prediction is they're going to create quiet theaters, QTs, where unlike the Alamo Draft House, where the whole movie theater or the whole place is quiet, no talk, no text, get kicked out. They're going to have just like the quiet train on an Amtrak where you go into that compartment and you're not allowed to speak on your phone. You're not allowed to listen to anything loud. You must have earplugs in and you get yelled at and or kicked out if you can't deal with being in the quiet train. 
they're going to come up with quiet theaters because they're having a hard time bringing people into the movies nowadays. Uh, the uh, millennial generation is not going as much, so it's up to my generation to save them. And the only way they're going to save us or save themselves through us is if they keep one theater where everybody has to shut the hell up because people are sick of it. And that's the number one cause when you see people complaining about theaters is it's people are on the phone, people are talking, people are talking during the film. You can't complain because you might get shot, blah, 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 blah. So back to this. So my movie going experience was great. The two people, I kind of turned around as kind of a knee jerk reaction. I didn't have an attitude. They didn't have an attitude. They were cool about it. I was cool about it. It was just a reaction. They knew it was just a reaction. And the reason why I'm telling you all of that about my experience was that I did laugh in places where I could sense that they were like, why is this funny? Like, like woo PS, like that kind of a thing. (laughs) Sort of. But, but they laughed at other things that I didn't find funny. They laughed at more uh, slapstick-esque mm-hmm. type of things. You know, like when Adam Driver sticks his head out the window with the machete in and chops his head off and then tries to chop that one person's head off. Oh, and they had a big laugh during the whole hotel scene where he was killing uh, Selena Gomez and, and all he those. holds their head up, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. They were laughing at that. And I thought that was funny too, but not the same thing as in... You know, having a conversation about the director giving you a script when the other actor didn't get the script. I mean, that was hysterical to me. And maybe that's because of my background. But to me, it was funny. So for me, this film had a couple of requirements. I had to understand why Jim Jarmusch was doing a zombie film. And I understood that he was making a statement about the world. You know, the whole polar fracking thing in this film. The whole casting Rosie Perez as the newscaster. Pretty famous looking person and pretty, I mean, maybe not well known to the masses now, but she's pretty well known. Her to be the face of the newscast, it's making a statement. So he took a genre film, if you want to call it that, and turned it into a political statement about all of the things that he is concerned about. And I think that's a really good way to tell Mm -hmm. this kind of story. I think it's a really good way. You get people in and there are people who love zombie films and there are people who like horror films. And then all of a sudden they're learning something about the way that they should be. It's interesting after watching um, Only Lovers Left Alive, there is a scene very similar where Tilda Swinton sees some mushrooms growing in the back of um, Tom Hiddleston's uh, house and she goes you're not supposed to be here you're you're growing at the wrong time and I'll see you next autumn and Tom Waits kind of has that same scene and I think it is mushrooms in this it film is. too where yeah. he's like he, sh- he should be growing at this point there aren't as many societal thumbprints in only lover lovers left alive as there is in this one but it's definitely makes its statement about the water world uh, wars and how, you know, when the South is burning, Tilda Swinton says Detroit will come back alive. And that's in uh, will bloom is what she says. And only lovers left alive. So and that makes sense because vampire films are not as over the top horror films in general. They have more of a subtlety to them. So. Maybe he wanted to make a zombie film so he can make all of these grand gestures and all these grand subject matters, put them on a platter and say, hey, you need to listen to this kind of stuff. But how do you do that without being preachy? How do you do that without being, you know, uh, patting your own back and being too clever for your own good? You make a zombie film, then you talk about all that stuff in between. I I thought it was pretty good. Mm -hmm. You know, makes sense to me. Yeah, I I did like the when we. Uh, started off the movie where you had kind of a little bit of a cold open and then there's the then there's the theme song and they spend the whole theme song doing the credits and I'm like man they don't do that very often anymore where they play a whole theme song especially with like nothing on screen other than just the names I thought that was an interesting choice but then I come to, you know you come to find out very quickly that it's going to come back again and every time it comes back again especially the first time where they break the fourth wall where he says what's well, the theme song to them you know he doesn't even say that's the theme song to the movie. He just says that's the theme song. And then it, it keeps coming back over and over and over again with Selena Gomez and with Caleb Landry Jones and, and all that. So I thought that was a really cool thread through the movie. I thought that was that was fun and interesting and exciting. But 
yeah, the 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 references. I didn't get. I mean, you're get you're getting real deep into some of those references, but I did get the Wu Tang Clan reference with RZA. Uh, you know, Wu P S. I got that one, and there's. I mean, it, some of the. I mean, there, there's a a couple other things, but uh, well, obviously the Make America White Again, all that with Steve Buscemi's character, and I mean, you know, it, it's. It's some of that humor is kind of right down the plate, and I don't have a problem with that. I love Diggy Pop. I I love, and then I guess the other zombie at the beginning was Sarah Driver, and she's in it was in Scrubs, and she's been in a couple of other movies. But I haven't seen as many Jarmusch movies as you have. So I mean, I've you know only seen a handful. I've seen uh, Coffee and Cigarettes, and I've seen Only Lovers Left Alive, and I think there's like one other one that I've seen. But anyway, so I I did not get. Uh, all of the the really deep references. I haven't even seen Broken Flowers, and I heard that's really good. And, oh, I love that yeah. one. Have you seen Ghost Dog? No, I do. I with, I need to see it. Yeah, with with uh, Forrest Whitaker good too. Yeah, yeah, I loved that one. And then he did a, a um, I, I don't. Well, it's an anthology, I guess, called Night on Earth about the cab drivers in four different parts of the world wow. at the same time. Oh, yeah, cool. and it's got a hell of a cast. Um I think actually that's the one Rosie Perez is in cuz I think she's in a uh and then Dead Man with Johnny Depp. Have you seen that one? Mm-hmm. Nope. But that's weird too, right? Uh, yeah. That's not like a straight down the middle type of a movie, right? Um I don't know anybody who would describe any Jarmusch film as straight down the middle. I just don't. Yeah, Rosie Perez is in that. Yeah, she's in the New York segment. Yeah, that's got a hell of a cast. Um, you know, international cast, but a hell of a cast. It's just a really good film, and it's four separate parts. And, uh, you know, like I said, four separate cab drivers at the same time mm-hmm. on Earth, picking up somebody and traveling around. So, yeah. Wow. So you have, you've not seen a lot. So no, okay. I haven't. Yeah. I mean, like there's a, a lot of famous ones that I have not seen, you know, yeah. Mystery train. I haven't seen stranger than paradise down by law, any of them. So that's, that's kind of a hole in my, uh, in my viewing Patterson. I want to see that too with Adam driver. Yeah, I loved it. Yeah. I loved it. It was one of those ones. I was like, Adam driver, Jarmusch. That makes sense to me. Let me rent it. And then I was like, ah, oh, this film is good. And it's, see a lot of people would say slow and I understand that, but I say purposefully paced. It's, it has a pace that does not conform to what you would traditionally think of as a two hour movie. And to me, I like that because that means that the, uh, he's going at a pace where you're supposed to take in certain things and we're so used to just go, 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 go that we're missing things. And then, like punch drunk love comes to mind whenever anybody says that that's a slow movie. I was so slow. Somebody once said, and I was like, but that's the point. There's a reason why there's a reason why things are slow in that film, but you can't really explain. That's that's a torturous movie. And that's why I like That's why I like punch drunk love because it's, it's pulling, it's pulling at you and it's pulling at you slowly, I think. But this movie doesn't seem torturous to me. It seems, it seems a, a somewhat meandering, I guess, or it brings it brings up all of these characters, and then it doesn't. Like I, when we see a lot of the characters have become zombies, it's just kind of like what there. There's no there's no emotion paid to them. It's just kind of like, well, yeah, they're a zombie. Like, what do you expect? Everybody's going to be a zombie. It's you know, this is just the inevitability of life, and so there's no real hope in the movie. <laughs> <laughs> that it's just kind of it it just kind of happens the movie just kind of happens so there's no there's no like here's what we need to do even if it's a if it's a statement movie if it's a these are the bad you know these are bad things happening to people and these people are complicit in this there's no there's no kind of like or else or otherwise they could have done this or i mean the only the only character that they the only characters to get away are Tilda Swinton and uh, Tom Waits, the, you know, Hermit Bob. And so, I, I mean, you can either be, I don't know if she's an alien or if she was someone who like kind of transcended t- uh, past all of, all of the zombie stuff. And cause you know, you never see her with a phone. You never see her worrying about little things or I, she's, she's very focused on 
what she, you know, on, on her job and on her martial arts training and all that stuff. And same thing with uh, Hermit Bob. He's living in the land, living on the land, living away from all the people in society. And he seems to live, I guess, a pure life in, in the in the context of this movie. And those are the only two ones that were saved. So I, I don't know. And wait, what, wasn't he the narrator? Yeah. Although it doesn't really seem like, I mean, it does, but it doesn't, you know, because it's one of those things where, yeah, I guess he's the narrator. Right right at the end, he talks about how, you know, it's it, it, there's like a voiceover and it's him saying, you know, that they're not going to make it or whatever. I just think that it's not, it's not a filmmaker's responsibility or screenwriter's responsibility to to tell us how to make it better or to tell us what we can do so we can stop the zombie apocalypse. I think it's, it's in that line Riza has, um, the world is perfect. Appreciate the details. There it is. He told you, Mm. he, he tells us, Jim Jarmusch tells us right there, the world is perfect. So to want to be, that's why there's, it's dripping with irony that Selena Gomez is the, the hipster. Although they don't really look like hipsters to me, but maybe that's hipster well, modern they're day. They're calling them hipsters, hipsters cuz they don't know what hipsters are. That's I think that's the joke. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, I guess just like they call what's his name Frodo or Bilbo. Yeah. Um your man. Uh who I like who I like in this movie. What's his name? Caleb Landry Jones. Yeah. I like him in this one. Uh sometimes I think he's a bit miscast and you're right he makes these very bold choices. This one I think it works in because he needs to be that young guy who is knowledgeable about these things but he can't really be i don't know it just worked for me but back to your point about there's no what do we do what do we how do we make it better i mean we already know how we make it better we have quiet theaters so people shut the hell up so people can hear things in movie theaters that's what we do we tell people to get off their phones and to unplug for an hour or Go for a walk. And it's all explained in the movie. I just don't think it has to be summed up. I like the fact that we push and we push and we push and we push. And these things start to happen. And by this point, it's a point of no return. So it's we've caused all this to happen. So it's our demise. And why should it have some kind of hope? Why should it have some kind of happy ending? There is hope. The fact that we're watching a movie about this so we don't, recreate these patterns there's the hope but to actually interject hope or a solution to the problem first of all doesn't strike me as something jim jarmusch would do but i mean i'm not speaking for him because i don't you know i don't know him but for me from what i'm watching from his movies i think it would be pandering and condescending for him to say well you know if y'all gathered around and went out to the campfire every once in a while and sang kumbaya the world would be a much better place it would be it wouldn't fit. So to actually have your heroes, um, your protagonists actually die and actually have to go through something. And I don't know if it's irony or if it's just, um, there's a predictability to Adam driver going, I don't think this is going to end. Well, I thought for sure he was going to say, um, I got a bad feeling about this. (laughs) And then, yeah, I did. And then they make a Star Wars reference. And then they make a Star Wars reference. See, I think she is an alien. I think Tilda Swinton is an alien. Um, And yeah, because of the sci-fi comment she makes about, that's respectable sci-fi Star Wars. Um, It's also Jim Jarmusch's way of going, you know, I respect that genre too. And watch, he'll end up doing a sci-fi film next. But for me, maybe because... Being a Boy Scout, being raised in the woods, not raised in the woods, but raised camping and your respect for the environment, you know, leaving a place pristine, even better than when you first came. All of those lessons that I've learned. um, So I can get frustrated in my life now when I see people throwing bottles out of their cars in the parking lot, or I can just pick up the bottle and put it in the trash myself or recycle the bottle myself Mm -hmm. or make sure I recycle or make sure I don't use non-recyclable products. That's what I can do. So to actually tie it up with a air quote, happy ending or a solution to me, doesn't seem like it fits. I don't, we thought we had the answers. It was the questions we had wrong. He's posing questions that we need to answer ourselves. I don't think he needs to answer what the question is. Mm -hmm. He's already posed the question. And 
if we're not getting it by this point in this society, will we ever? Maybe we're doomed to repeat these things over and over again until something, you know, apocalyptic happens. You know, and I think it's it's easy to make it into a zombie film and it's easy to make the moon look purple, which I think looks really cool. And I want a t-shirt of that, by the way. And it's maybe with some wolves like howling at it. No, not wolves, <laughs> just the purple moon. I don't need all that wolf stuff. I don't need all that, you know, cliche stuff. I need the purple moon because that was unique yeah. looking and to have it off, you know, the, the earth is off its axis and that's why the dead is dead or rising it's blending two different things at one time. It's blending your zombie films. And I think actually there is uh, the night of the comet or some zombie movie that the earth is, is off its axis. That's why hmm. they even pay um, homage to George Romero at some point in this film. Yeah. So, you know, I just think for me, if you're not getting it at this point in one's life, I don't think a movie should be able to say, this is how we solve it. Not, this particular movie maybe another movie yeah. but not this one well and you're right it's not a statement movie it's not a you know a factual like here's the things that happened here's what we need to do it's not a even a vice type movie see i think that's where vice kind of shines is that it's taking real things and it's it's perverting them and making absurdist changes and and just make it twisting it enough to make it entertaining but at the same time it's it's pushing forward an agenda whereas this movie is not necessarily pushing forward an agenda it's just kind of pushing your face up against a metaphor of what the filmmaker thinks society is doing now and what society is doing to themselves what society is doing to the the earth and you know, and that's it. And his, I guess it's not an answer, but his kind of like his inevitability is this isn't going to end well. And I think that's probably the theme of the movie is that this isn't going to end well. Cause it doesn't, the movie doesn't seem to be, doesn't seem to have an upbeat feeling to it, which the, you know, Riza's quote does have an upbeat feeling to it. It's saying, you know, Riza's saying and enjoy our perfect world but it seems like what this movie is saying is that like we're not enjoying the perfect world and it's not going to end well. So, I mean, I, I don't know. I think, I think I, I think I got it. So let me ask you this. Do you feel like the expectations you had of the film? Okay. The expectation of the theme of this is not going to end well. Was that not executed well with the story that you saw? Or are you looking for an upbeat feeling in this movie? Because you, you just mentioned it doesn't have an upbeat feeling. Does that connotate that you thought it should? Um, which is fine if you thought it yeah. should. But from the trailer, um, I thought it should. I thought it should have it, at oh. least some kind of a, not like a, I don't know. I, I, I hate to compare it to other zombie comedy movies because there aren't that many out there. I mean, you've got Shaun of the Dead and I'm sure there's other ones that have comedic parts. I've seen... Zombieland. Yeah, Zombieland. I've seen... Dawn of the Dead. I've seen some of the, you know, the earlier Romero stuff. I've not seen Night of the Living Dead, but uh, and and I know there's certain parts that may be construed as as humorous, but not specifically like Zombieland or Shaun of the Dead. So I can't. I'm not trying to like say this needs to be Shaun of the Dead Part Two. I'm not saying that, but I I at the same time, I do feel like the marketing department did kind of like cherry pick things and and push them out to where I felt like we were moving towards we were moving one way and we ended up in, in a different way and I'm not saying that like I'm not saying that Bill Murray and Adam Driver should have been able to kill every zombie on the on the planet I'm not saying that either but it it was just I don't know it was abrupt the ending was abrupt and it was just kind of like don't let the door hit you on the way out yeah but that's kind of surprising that you weren't thrilled by that because I am traditionally not as cynical as you are and not as aware of what we're going through in a non-condescending way. Like you go to the Alamo draft house for a reason. And maybe that's why I told that story about the quiet theater, because there's a theme here where you go there for a reason. And it's not only because it's a cool place and it is a cool place. 
It's that it fits your needs and your desires as a theater going experience. Mm -hmm. And you don't like going to other places because there are certain things that happen. So for me, I always, and I'm not saying um, it's not a judge, judgment statement. I'm not saying you're expecting bad things to happen and people to uh, have outbursts and all that other stuff, but I'm always expecting it to be a good experience. And then when it turns out to not be, I'm not that surprised. I think maybe you work a little bit from a different point of view where you're like hoping it's not going to be a bad experience, but when it does happen, you're like, yep, I knew it was going to happen. You know, this is why I go to the Alamo draft house. This is why Paul theory of quiet theater should exist. And it kind of eats at you. So if we were talking about how things are advertised versus what our experience was based on after this advertisement, this trailer, how we felt about the movie, that would be a different podcast. But because I don't normally hear you saying stuff like the trailer uh, influenced me enough to to skew the way that I see a film. And skew kind of makes it sound like it's a, a negative bent, but not necessarily. And you have said that you need to stay away from uh, trailers, that you purposely stay away from certain stuff. And you're only going to see the first one. And only if you see it in the movie theater when they show it, that kind of stuff. Because yep. it does influence you. But I would say... From my experience, you're going to have to figure out how to separate the two because one is a marketing tool and one is the film. And I learned that way back when, when uh, somebody said, do you know Fight Club has a romantic comedy trailer? And I went, what? <laughs> There's no way. And when the DVD or I guess it was VHS tape at the time came out, they showed all the trailers and there was this one. There was a boy. There was a girl. Tyler and Marla, they finally meet and you see them holding mm -hmm. hands at the very end of the film when the, have you seen that trailer? Yeah. It's mm -hmm. bizarro, but it reminds you of a romantic comedy. And if you didn't know anything else about fight club, you would go into that movie going, where's Sandra Bullock and what the hell is going on here? Because what mm -hmm. is this? So I find it fascinating that you were so influenced by the trailer that you're actually having an interesting time accepting the film for what it was because of how you were influenced by it. That's interesting. But for me, I don't, I just, I think I rolled my eyes at the trailer because I was like, oh, I'm not into it. You know, zombie mm -hmm. films, Jarmouche, what's happening here? What happened to samurais and cool people? What's going on here? Well, I was wrong because it, it, it was completely different than what I expected it to be. But my expectations were, were based on not understanding what the director and screenwriter, who happens to be the same person, what they want from us watching a zombie film. Well, now I understand it because I've seen the movie. Mm -hmm. So for me, to have any kind of hopeful or any kind of resolution, I think would have ruined the film for me. I think I made this point already, but for me, it just would have... The fact that they die mm -hmm. is, is perfect for me because one, he keeps repeating it. And two, it, it, it is a metaphor. It is be careful what you wish for. You're going to end up eating each other over these stupid things that we think are the important parts of life. If we don't do something about the environment, just for the mere fact of taking care of our environment, let's say that global warming doesn't exist. Let's say that, you know, uh, deforestation doesn't influence anything. But let's say all of that's not true, but we should still take care of the house that we live in. You clean mm -hmm. your house out of respect for the fact that you have it and that you, you don't want to take things for granted. And plus it's gross when you don't clean your bathroom and it's gross when you don't vacuum your floor and it's gross when you don't do your dishes, you need to take care of your environment. So let's just take care of our environment. That's a very simplistic way to break down why human beings should be much better at taking care of this planet. There's a whole other conversation about why we should be doing what we're doing but we're not getting it as a society we're not getting it so if you have this issue as a filmmaker how do you get people to understand that they're not getting it without being condescending and talking down and telling them what to do and being bono 
you know, by pointing the finger and wanting to save the world, because that doesn't seem to be working because the cynical millennials want to take him down because, you know, he's pompous and he's this and he's that, and he's trying to save the world. Uh, Okay. So now that's a bad thing. I don't get it, (laughs) but I, I just don't get it. But I understand that when you push something in people's faces and you tell them what they should do to help other people who are from another country or help other people who are dying of AIDS, when you push it and you push it and you push it, and you show up with the Pope and you show up with Bush and you show up with all of these people that are completely in contradiction to what you believe is uh, the way the world should be. I understand how you could be cynical towards him after that. I get it. But the bottom line is, is that he saved millions of people by doing what he's done. So how do you get this world that's eating itself alive, that's being zombies to each other, how do you get them to focus on that? You take this really cool director, these really cool actors, and you make a zombie film where you tell people it's all right there. You just have to look at it. It's all right there. Hold on a second. Let me get on my ladder to get down from my soapbox because that was it was really high up there that time. I just hope that more than the people i just hope it's not the whole like preaching to the choir thing i hope that more people than just jim jarmusch fans go and see this movie Uh, because i think that's what he's hope that's what he's hoping for too because he wants to get them that his particular message out to more and and that's another reason to to do a zombie movie rather than do like a sit-down conversation between climatologists and you know uh and and famous actors so i yeah i i hope that more people see it but i i still i still felt like the there was there's in there was an incongruity there for me that that i i don't that i kind of now want to go back to the movies that i haven't seen of his and and see if he's if this is a through line in all of in all of his films or if it's just a fairly new thing for him that he wants to he feels like he wants to take his status and his resources and and bring the things that he's concerned about to light in a new and interesting and creative way i would venture to say that it's always been there and it's just ramped itself up and that he's now taking on these genres of zombie films and vampire films because if you watch um only lovers left alive i haven't said it yet uh if you watch that again we're all zombies and we're all screwed period i mean uh john hurt says as uh christopher marlowe that he wishes that tom hiddleston's character was alive he had met him before he wrote hamlet because there's that whole thing that they are saying that christopher marlowe wrote all of shakespeare's Mm -hmm. and christopher marlowe couldn't do it because he was a vampire and couldn't be seen in the public's eye so he gave it to shakespeare to pretend to have his stuff it's a clever way of talking about that theory um, it's really clever, actually. I kind of chuckled. I was like, oh, I missed all that the first time. And if I was very cynical about that film, I kind of take it back because I, I don't think I understood it at the time. And I, I and I was also kind of over that whole brooding zon- or brooding vampire thing. I was like, whatever. Interestingly enough, the stuff I said about how I wish Tom Hiddleston's character would have been, Tilda Swinton's character says that about him in the movie. She's like, oh, you should be happy or 400 years old and you 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 speak all these languages and you know all this stuff it when are you gonna you still don't get it she says you should love life for what it is but anyway the point to all that is is that in that film we're zombies and we're done that there is no helping us and because of this hamlet slash brooding slash uh vampire character um tom hiddleston's character adam um he sees the demise of human beings because of the wires that he sees on the wall walls and that they're fighting over oil still when it should be water and all this other stuff that he just is doom and gloom that there is no hope for society. And in a way that's kind of in the dead don't die. But at the same time, there's these little aspects of hope that, the quote that we talked about earlier, that it's all right there in front of us. You just just absor- absorb it um, and, and recognize it. There's a whole bunch of little things that Tom Waits says throughout the film that are sparks of, hey, if we just focus on this instead of your cell phone and your downloads or your, you know, uh, 
your likes or whatever we're focused on in this world, then maybe it will slowly get better. So there are these little bits of hope. And I would venture to say that I bet you Jim Jarmusch has been saying these things for decades. It's probably just ramping itself up into a full length movie about zombies because we're still not getting it. But at the same time, that said, you know, the whole, the whole I'm woke, I'm awakened, that whole theory of men now having to be in a different world because they have to wake up to how they've been treating women. This is just a statement about a general thing. I'm not making a statement of how I feel about it is, is a progression. It is progress. It is learning how to adapt to how others feel when you have not had to worry about that your whole entire life. So there is progress. So for me, I, I, you know, you don't come out of this movie uplifted because you just don't, it, you know, everybody dies, but ironically that's Hamlet. So, you know, Shakespeare wrote it 400 years ago. So, I mean, it, it worked for him, but you, I did come out of it understanding that the things that I see and do in my world are more in line with the possibility of the world getting better mm -hmm. than making it worse. Yeah. Cause I don't give a shit about my phone. I don't give a crap about Facebook or downloads or uh, I don't care. None of it influences me at all. Yes. I'm thrilled when somebody likes us on Twitter. I'm thrilled when somebody likes us at uh, for a review of the podcast, but none of that stuff matters. None of it getting a moment right and true and honest on stage that interests me being honest and truthful in a conversation between two people who've just seen a movie between you and I, that thrills me. Having my father go to a movie and understand something and find, we went to see the mule, the Clint Eastwood film. And he was like, that's an awfully sad film. Having that emotional reaction, that thrills me, that lights me up. So I don't know. Hell, help me, get me down, get me down from the soapbox. Oh, that's okay. I'll just edit it all out. Um, <laughs> <laughs> all right I, I will say this let's do this in five years let's go back and watch both of these movies again let's watch the dead don't die and let's watch um only lovers left only alive. lovers left alive i hadn't said it yet <laughs> yay and then in between that time let's explore some more jim jarmusch films and see if you're right see if there are other themes but yeah i'm good okay great well after all of that talk about why, you know, you need to get off your phones and all that stuff, I'm going to say, first of all, go outside, enjoy the sunset, which right now the sun is setting. And after that, maybe pick up your phone and then you can uh, check us out on Facebook at facebook.com slash actor and engineer, or you can tweet us at actor engineer, or you can go to our website, actorandengineer.com. So we'll see you next time.